We're gathered here today to celebrate the love that Sarah and Matt have for one another and their love for God. It's such a joy to be gathered here with friends and family as we celebrate this special moment in time. Sarah, do you take Matt to be your husband to have and to hold from this day forward? I do. As long as we spend the holidays with my parents and he stops leaving the toilet seat up. <laughs> for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. I do. Now I guess I can tell him about the student loans I haven't exactly started paying. In sickness and in health until death parts you. I do. As long as he keeps all his hair and I never have to touch his feet. <laughs> and Matt, do you take Sarah to be your wife to have and to hold from this day forward? I do. As long as we spend the holidays with my parents, and she's fine with video games on Monday with the boys, and tailgating every season, golf on Saturdays, plus hunting the months of November, December. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. I do. And I can't wait to surprise her until I paid off all my student debt. <laughs> in sickness and in health until death parts you. I do. And as long as she doesn't lose her figure after the kids. If anyone has any objection to why these two should not be married, speak now or forever hold your peace. We're going to be so happy. We're going to be so happy. I'm going to rock it being a husband. So we go into marriage with all of these great expectations about what our life's going to be together. But we also so often go into marriage with different expectations about how we're going to get there. And I'm always amazed, or actually I used to be amazed, less so now, when I do premarital counseling with a couple that's going to get married in just a couple of months, and they haven't talked about some really basic things of what's going to happen. Are, are they going to have kids? When? How many? Where are they going to celebrate Thanksgiving that's coming up 30 days after they get married? And where are they going to celebrate Christmas? Getting married is the easy part, right? All you need is a little piece of paper and, I guess, an Elvis impersonator somewhere in Vegas, and you can make that happen. But making a marriage that lasts and that brings glory and honor to God, that's the hard part. See, the goal of a Christian marriage is to have this lifelong par partnership that glorifies God because he put it all together, but also brings us joy and happiness as we go through the ups and downs of life. I heard, a I heard a story about a couple. They had been married for 60 years, and they were celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary at this big hotel, ballroom, friends and family from all over came in to celebrate. After the, the celebration, they go up to the honeymoon suite that their kids had rented for them. It was this big suite that had multiple rooms. They spent a little time talking together, and then they got in bed. And they'd been in bed for a couple of minutes, and the wife looked over at her husband and said, Honey, do you remember what you did to me on our wedding night? He's like, I don't know. And she said, You gave me a big hug. So he kind of grunted and rolled over, and he gave her a big hug and rolled back over and a couple minutes later, she said, do you, do you remember what you did after you gave me that big hug? I don't know. She said, you, you gave me a little kiss right here on the cheek. So with a groan, he rolled over in the bed and gave her a kiss on the cheek and rolled back over. And a couple of minutes later, she said, do you, you remember what you did after that? And he said, what? And she said, you kind of nibbled on my neck right here. The old man grunted and got up out of bed and started leaving the bedroom. And she's like, honey, where are you going? To get my teeth. <laughs> Isn't that the goal of marriage? Not to have teeth that sleep in a different bedroom, but to have a relationship that is still thriving and vibrant all those years later. See, that's the goal of marriage, and that's God's goal as well. Here is God's plan for marriage. One man, one woman, one lifetime. That's his plan, but it's easier said than done. If you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Genesis 2, 18 through 25. We're kicking off a brand new sermon series today called Save the Date. Let me ask you a question. Who actually thought we were going to do a marriage, a wedding? Yeah, for just a minute I had you, didn't I? Uh, but we're kicking off this new sermon series, and I actually did officiate Matt and Sarah's wedding 
about five months ago when they really got married and didn't have vows where they thought about stuff in their head. And some of you are like that. We're all in different places when it comes to marriage. We've got several newlywed couples in our church that are similar to Matt and Sarah, and you're getting started. There are some of you guys that have been married for a while, and your marriage is awesome. And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about some tips and strategies and truths from the Bible that maybe make that just a little bit better. Some of you guys are in a little different place. You're in a place where you're surviving, but, but you're not thriving. And if you're honest, there's a lot more frustration and unhappiness than there is joy and happiness in your marriage. And, and then some of you guys, you wish you could be in that place where you're surviving. You're really struggling. And, and you're to a place where maybe you're talking about separation or divorce pretty openly at this point. I heard about a Christian marriage counselor recently that will counsel some couples that are really struggling in their marriage to go ahead and just, they need to end it. They need to, it's not going to work. There is no way this marriage is going to work. And they need to just start over with each other. Now, that sounds a little naive, right? I mean, you just start over with each other until you think about, that's what happens with our soul. That's what Jesus does for us. He takes this old, broken, busted, beat up person, weighed down by sin and shame, and he makes us into a new creation. And if he can do that for us as individuals, he can also do that for us as a couple. And so at the end of this four-week series, I'm going to challenge some of you guys to start over, to recommit to the vows that you made however long ago and start over again because you need a new marriage with each other. And so hopefully, no matter where you're at in your marriage, over the next few weeks, you are going to learn some truths from God's Word to help make your marriage better. Now, There is one group this morning that may be feeling a little left out. That's our singles. You may be sitting there going, maybe I should just take the next three weeks off because this doesn't really apply to me. I would tell you you're actually wrong about that because marriage is a beautiful picture or a symbol of our relationship with God. In the Old Testament, God talked about his relationship with the nation of Israel as being that of a husband and a bride. And then Jesus regularly calls himself the bridegroom in the New Testament, and the church is his bride. And so we can learn a lot about marriage from looking at our relationship with Jesus, but we can also learn a whole lot about our relationship with Jesus by talking about what it looks like to have a successful marriage and a relationship between a husband and wife. And and so I would also say to singles that In two weeks, we're going to have a marriage, I mean, a sermon just for you guys, and it's living in singleness, and so that day is just for you. Also, in our community groups, we're not going to be talking about marriage. We're going to talk about marriage as an illustration or a picture of what our relationship and our connection with God looks like. So you're going to want to be here for all of that. All right, so our scripture for today is at the very beginning of the Bible. It's God's creation story. It's in Genesis chapter 2. The good news is if you're looking for it in your Bible, it's about page 3, so it's easy to find. And so we see at this point, God has made the heavens and the earth. He's made Adam. He's made uh, all of the animals are all there. And so let's pick up with verse 18 of chapter 2 of Genesis. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So up to this point in creation, God has made something and he's looked at it and said, it's good. It's good. It's good. And then he makes man and he says, it is very good. But for the first time, God looks down and says, it is not good for man to be alone. And so what does he do about that? He's going to make a helper for Adam. Look at verses 19 through 25. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and then he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. 
So here's what's happening. So Adam is created. He's naming all of the animals in the Garden of Eden, and he's so busy, he really doesn't even think about the fact that there's nobody else like him. But God knows, and so God puts Adam to sleep and forms woman out of one of Adam's ribs. Now think about this. The last thing Adam sees before he goes to sleep is a bunch of dirty, smelly animals. The first thing he sees when he wakes back up is Eve standing there wearing nothing but a smile. So you can just imagine his reaction. He says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Let me modernize that for you a little bit. He's going, this is different. This is like me, but better. Thank you, God. (laughs) Just wrap her up. I'll take her. Just leave her like she is. We're good. That's not actually in the Bible, but I'm pretty sure that's what Adam probably said in that moment. Here at the beginning, at the very beginning of creation, we have the first marriage. And that's important to understand for today. God created marriage. It was at the very beginning of time that he made this intention of one man, one woman, one lifetime. The book of Genesis was written by, the, by Moses about 3,500 years ago. And at the very beginning of this creation story, of this account of creation, marriage is discussed. Pastor and author Max Licata says this about marriage. God created marriage. No government subcommittee invented it. No social organization developed it. Marriage was conceived and born in the mind of God. So, if marriage was made by God, if it was invented by God and given to us as a gift, it makes sense for us to look at what God has to say about this created gift that he gave us. So let's kind of break down this passage of scripture that we looked at and talk about that together. This is Genesis 2, 24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, you English teachers are going to love this next little section because I'm going to kind of break down and they become one flesh. But it starts with they are united. In other words, the moment Matt and Sarah got married five months ago, they were united. Before God, with God, they were united. But they will not become one flesh immediately. It starts right then, but then it continues for the rest of their lifetime. So you have this immediate uniting, but then you have this becoming one flesh over time. So Matt and Sarah are just as united in marriage as Lil and I are at 35 years, but we've had more time to become one flesh. Now, we haven't always taken the best advantage of that, but we've had that time to work at that. Do you see the difference? Immediately united, but then you become one flesh over time. It takes time and effort. And so if we want to divorce-proof our marriages, we've got to figure out how do we become one flesh. What does that look like for us to become one over time? And so I want to talk about three truths today to help make this a reality, that we become one flesh. So the first thing we can do as a couple, if we want to become one flesh, is to become one spiritually. See, for so many Christian couples, we have our own individual faith. We have our separate connection and prayer time and relationship with God, but we don't have a mutuality of that relationship with God. We haven't bonded together as husband and wife to have a single connection with God as one unit, one flesh, that we have this relationship. And if we want to divorce-proof our marriages, God has to be part of it. It has to be. And we're going to talk about some things here in a minute, that uh, statistic that might actually even shock you a little bit. So Jesus, in Mark chapter 9, he's asked about the issue of divorce. And he is said, you know, when's it Okay. And look at his response. This is verses 6 through 9 of Mark 10. And he's going to quote back to Genesis 2 for part of this, but then he adds something to it. He says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Verse 9 here, he's adding something. He is saying, God put it together. He's not saying because you took some vows, you need to stick to those vows. He's saying, God put this thing together. Don't tear apart what God put together. God is a part of your marriage whether you intend him to be or not. The vows that you took at your wedding weren't just to each other. Whether you knew it or not, even if it was in front of a JP, those vows were taken to God. And and so he's part of the wedding ceremony, and he needs to be a part of the marriage. So if we want to divorce-proof our marriage, we've got to involve Christ in our relationship. And and there's a number of ways to do this, but the first one is probably the most difficult. 
and that is to pray together. And look, I know that sounds a little intimidating to some of you guys. It just feels uncomfortable, and I get that. But there are incredible studies that show that couples that pray together stay together. There's some studies that show that the divorce rate among couples that pray every single day together is significantly less than 1%. So way less than 1 in 100 couples that pray together every single day get divorced. If the average divorce rate is a little under 50%, that's a huge difference between the general couple and a couple that prays together every day. And if you don't believe me, you can Google that later and check that out for yourself. It's true. And and I think there's several reasons why this works, why praying together as a couple every day works. And the first is we cannot discount the power of prayer. Prayer is a powerful tool as a Christian, and we need to use it way more than we do. Listen to what James says about this in James 5, 16. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If you believe that, then as a couple, you should be praying together for your marriage. Pray that God would protect your marriage from all the temptations that come along, that he would grow you closer together and show you what it looks like to submit and to serve one another in greater ways. If you're not praying together as a couple, you're missing an important tool to improve your marriage and to become one flesh. I think there's another reason why praying together is an important tool for divorce-proofing your marriage. It is good communication. Now, let me be clear here. You're not communicating with each other. You're communicating and talking to God, but you're doing it together. And if you're doing it right, you're sharing intimately about your hopes and your fears and your hang-ups, and you're learning more about each other as you go. You're praying to God, but as you pray together to God, you're actually communicating with one another. Communication is a huge tool, and we're going to talk about that almost every week, about different ways that we can communicate better. But it's a huge part of that. And when we pray together, we're communicating with one another as we talk to God. And here's the last reason that I believe praying together makes such a difference. It it keeps us from having anger and bitterness and holding grudges. Has this ever worked for you? It works for me. So if I don't really like somebody, (laughs) but I start praying for them, I find myself starting to see the good in that person, not the bad that I thought I saw before. And I think what happens is when you're praying for God's best for that person, it's hard to see the worst. And and so for couples, especially you couples that struggle with holding bitterness and frustration with each other, praying together will dramatically change that. Because if you're doing it right, you're praying for God's best for each other, and it helps you to see the best in one another. And I just think that's such a big thing, especially for you couples that really struggle with some frustration and bitterness from the past. So, pray together as a couple. Look, I'm going to be I'm going to shoot straight with you right here. It's going to feel really uncomfortable for a little bit. It's not going to feel right. So don't quit after a couple of days when it doesn't feel right. Keep doing it. Do it. I'm going to challenge you at the end to do it for 30 days and then see where you're at at that point. Because here's the thing, even if it feels a little awkward, If it takes your divorce rate from near 50% down to way less than 1%, isn't it it worth a little awkwardness to make your marriage better? That'll be the challenge. All right, here's some practical tips for praying together. First of all, keep it simple. If you're not used to praying, you don't have to pray for two hours. You don't even have to pray for 10 minutes. Pray for a couple of minutes. Pray for one another. Pray that God would protect your marriage. Pray that God would make you look more like Jesus as you relate to one another. Pray for your kids. Just keep it simple and you'll find that it will grow and you'll start to learn new things to talk to God about. The the second thing is don't try to impress. You're not talking to one another, you're talking to God. This is the God who invented the universe, made a billion trillion stars. You having some big words, it ain't going to impress him, so don't try. Don't worry about it. He's your father. Talk to him like that. Be honest with him. And that's the next thing. Be sincere. Don't try to act like you're better than you are. Don't try to act like you've got it all together. God knows already. You're not hiding anything from God. The more sincere and honest you are with God, the better your prayer will be. And finally, and most importantly, be consistent. you got to do it every day or it's not going to work this way. Couples that pray together stay together. That's not just biblical. That's studies that show that. Another way to grow spiritually together is to serve together. 
Find a ministry that you're passionate about and do it together. My wife and I, since we've had this church, man, we have grown so much closer together because we have a mission together. Whether that's student ministry or children's ministry or service to the homeless in our community. Be involved in that together and you'll see that as your relationship with God grows, that you'll also become one spiritually and become one flesh. All right. So that's the first thing. We can become one spiritually. The second thing we can do is to become one sexually. Sex is a powerful tool to help a husband and wife become one flesh. Look back at verse 25. It says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, I'm from East Texas, so sometimes I'm going to say naked, but it means the same thing as naked. They're the same word. Don't, don't quiz me on that later. They did not feel shame with one another and neither should we. God created it for our benefit. You know, there's an entire book of the Bible called the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. That The whole book is about the physical intimacy between a husband and his bride. And, and so as we look at that book, and we're not going to get, I promise you parents, you're going, oh, no, don't, I'm not going to go into the PG-13 part. Part of it is PG-13. We're not going to get there. We're going to stop at the PG, th- PG part. I guess, you know, maybe Jewish kids couldn't read certain parts of it if they weren't 13 years old back at the time. But uh, I want to read just a little bit of chapter 4. And if you're one of those people that thinks that sex shouldn't be talked about in church, I want you to go home and read the PG-13 section. And then we're going to ask the question, why did God put it in there? Why is it in the Bible? Why did God use that? All right, listen to what Solomon says in wooing his new bride in chapter 4. This is verses 1 through 4. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful. So Solomon is off to a good start. Man, he is wooing his wife. She walks into the room. He says, man, you are beautiful. So guys, let me ask you, when's the last time your wife walked into a room and you said, I forget how beautiful you are? So he's off to this good start. Look at what he says next. He says, your eyes behind your veil are doves. Starts with her face, looking at her eyes and says, your eyes are beautiful. Man, he's doing good. He's wooing his new bride. Let's see what he does next. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Okay, so he's getting a little off track here. He's probably a little nervous. It's a big moment for Solomon. I mean, I think he could have done better than your hair. Uh, It's like some goats. Uh, So guys, don't necessarily take this exactly. You know, maybe come up with a better something about, you know, not goats. Don't do goats. But but he's trying. I mean, he's still trying to, he's he's working here. Let's see this next part. This is my favorite. It says, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. (laughs) I don't, almost don't even need to, there's humor in that. You don't even really need me. But let's break it down. He's saying, you're beautiful because your teeth are white. All right, all right. But then he says, they've each got a match. They're all there. And, and that seems to be maybe a good compliment if you're from Mississippi or West Virginia, but maybe not so much here in Katy. Uh, where I grew up in Northeast Texas, that probably was a good thing. Baby, you're beautiful because you got almost all your teeth. <laughs> let's, let's move on before this sermon gets me into some trouble. Here's what he says next. He says, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. So I want you to know what Solomon is doing here. He starts with her eyes, and he begins to move down to her neck. And then we're going to stop here. This is where it gets a little PG-13, because then Solomon is going to undress his wife, and he's going to continue to compliment her beauty in the more erotic zones. And then it goes into some detail about their intimacy together. So what should we take from this? Why is this in the Bible? First of all, guys, Bible study, there's good stuff in there if you start getting in there. But God puts it in there to make it clear that sex was his idea. That in the context of marriage, it is a gift that's intended to be enjoyed and used. The church needs to talk about the beauty of sexuality. When the church only talks about the don'ts of sex... They're missing half the story. When they're saying, don't have sex before marriage, that's true, but that's not the beauty of the plan. The beauty of God's plan for sex isn't don't. It's do in the context of what God was intending. One man, one woman, one lifetime. And so that's the beauty in that context. Why is this important? If you struggle with intimacy in your marriage, maybe that's because 
of some sin that you committed in the past and you just kind of take that guilt and that shame into the bedroom with your husband or with your wife. You can't get past that. Maybe it's because you were told as you were growing up that sex is bad, just don't do it, and then suddenly everything's supposed to change when you get married. Or maybe that's because something terrible happened to you. You were the victim of a sexual assault or some sort of abuse, and so that goes with you into the bedroom. I I would really encourage you to go home and read the PG-13 parts of the Song of Songs and see the beauty that God intended for sex in the context of his plan for marriage. And then enjoy it. Learn that God intended that to be beautiful. It's a gift from God to help us become one flesh. So God gave us this gift of sex and marriage for us to enjoy. But it's so much deeper than that. And you can begin to see God's plan, not just for marriage, but for human sexuality. Sex is a tool that God created to literally bond us together, to help us become one flesh. It's actually addictive. I don't know if you know this, but when you have sexual intimacy, your brain releases this chemical called dopamine, and it just floods your brain that causes addiction. It's the same chemical that's released when someone abuses heroin or cocaine. It's addictive. God is literally addicting us to one another to make us one flesh through our sexuality, which is why pornography is so dangerous, because you're getting that same release of dopamine But instead of being addicted to your spouse, you're being addicted to some images on a screen. It's why casual sex is so dangerous because you're not becoming addicted to the person you're going to spend your life with. You're becoming addicted to the act of sex. Here's how cool God's gift is. Medical studies show that sex works as an antidepressant, a calming agent. It helps you sleep. Another recent study has shown that sex actually relieves pain. 60% of people with migraines and 30% of people with cluster headaches reported that after sex, they have partial or complete relief of that pain. So ladies, I have a headache is not a reason not to have sex. It's a reason to have sex. Guys, you're welcome for that one. You owe me. (laughs) Let's jump on down to chapter 5. We're skipping the PG-13 parts, but we're going to look at chapter 5, verse 1 of Song of Songs. Solomon says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends, and drink. Drink your fill of love. So Solomon is now talking about sex with his wife in past tense. And he says, I've I've gotten my fill of honey and honeycomb, and let's do do it some more. Let's, Let's party. That is God's plan for sex in the context of marriage. That's the beauty of that. That's why it's there. It is to remind us that God wants that for us in the context of his plan for marriage. Genesis 2 says, Adam and Eve were naked and they felt no shame. And and neither should we in the context of that marriage. Enjoy God's gift of sexuality. Don't let negative experiences that you've experienced in the past rob you of sex and physical intimacy the way God intended it. The awesome thing about the Bible, about so many different topics, but certainly about this topic of marriage, is that it, it just meets us right where we are. With, even if you don't buy the whole, uh, you know, Jesus rising from the dead, even if you're not there yet, there is beauty and wisdom in the Bible and truth that can make your marriage better. And, and I love that in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking in chapter 7 about marriage. And I'm going to look at the message paraphrase. This isn't the actual words of the Bible. This is a paraphrase. But I want you to see the beauty of what Paul is saying to us in marriage. He says, now getting down to the question you ask in your letter to me, First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sex life in a world of sexual disorder. Sound like where we live? The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve one another, whether in bed or out. I love that last part. Mutuality. It's a place to serve. Whether we're in bed, we're out of bed, we submit to one another, we serve one another because of our love for God. Sex drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them. Like a cool drink of water on a hot summer's day, sex in God's plan brings contentment, relaxation, and relief. Be creative within the confines of marriage and make sex fun. All right, so if we want to have 
a marriage where we become one, we need to become one spiritually. We need to become one sexually. And here's the last thing. Become one emotionally. We need to learn to love one another, to be friends, to have a friendship that grows. My wife is my very best friend in the world, and that's the way God intended it. He intended us to be connected emotionally so that we will be happy for richer or for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. That's the commitment we made on our wedding day, and it should be the process we strive towards throughout the rest of our lives until death parts us. 1 Peter 4.8 4, says this, Above all, love each other deeply because love cover, covers over a multitude of sins. That's not directed specifically at marriage. It's about how Christians relate to one another. But if it applies to how Christian brothers and sisters love one another generally, how much more does it apply to a Christian couple who are married? Love covers over sin. It covers over mistakes. It covers over differences of opinion. It covers over so many things. Love one another passionately. Grow to do that. I want to give you some practical ways to become one emotionally. First, communicate. You've got to talk to one another. And I'm not just talking about what are we going to do with the kids, what are we going to do this weekend. I'm talking about share your hopes, your fears, your dreams. Have a good time just talking with one another. Remember what you did before you got married and the way you talked to each other back then and reinstitute that again. Another thing is have fun. Christians should be some of the happiest people out there, and that should be true in our marriage. Don't take yourself so serious. Laugh. Cut up. My wife and I, we joke with each other all the time. We still wrestle on occasion. She's a biter, though, and my kids will back me up on that, so I don't do it as she is. She, she will bite. <laughs> we'll also chase each other around the house on occasion. And yes, she's faster than me, plus I like to get caught. So, But enjoy that. Another thing you can do is show appreciation to one another. Say thank you a lot. Thank each other for big things, taking care of the house, taking care of the kids, going to work every day, all the different things you do. But thank each other for the little things. Thanks for cleaning out the closet, making dinner, keeping the kids for a little bit. Say thank you a lot. Another thing you should say a lot is, I love you. I love you should be a constant phrase used in a marriage. My wife and I probably tell each other we love each other at least five to ten times every day. Because it's a reminder of what we're committing to and our goal. Another important tip is to fight fair. And, and we'll talk more about this in other weeks. But fighting fair is so important. You're going to have disagreements. So learn to do it well. First thing is do not let anger control. When you feel the anger rise up, you feel the volume start to increase, lower it back down. And remember, you're trying to resolve a problem, not win a fight. And, and so that's the first thing to fight fair. Don't go to bed angry. If you can help it, don't go to sleep angry because you're not going to sleep very well anyway. And then the next morning, if you're anything like my wife and I, we're still going to carry the frustration. Even if we're not still angry, we're frustrated. We're more likely to get into a fight the next day because we're frustrated with one another. Make up sex, that's a good thing. It'll, it blows off some frustration. Use that as a tool. It's a good thing to do. Another thing is never say the D word in a fight. Divorce, separation should never be talked about because here's the problem. One, it hurts, and so it's, it's not intended to resolve an argument. It's intended to win a fight. But the other thing that it does that's even more dangerous is it begins to sound more and more plausible. The more you say it, the more it still it starts to feel like a good idea. Don't even say the D word in a fight. Another thing you can do is make sure that you apologize. Saying you're sorry is one of the most important things we do as Christians and it's one of the most important things we do in a marriage because we need to recognize when we are at fault. That doesn't even mean if we didn't start the fight, but we made it worse, we did something or said something that wasn't right, we need to say our sorry. Do not let pride get in the way of saying you're sorry. James 5.15, remember it says, confess your sins to one another. That's important. Saying you're sorry goes a long way to ending fights and helping you move on. The last two things kind of go together. Forgive and forget. First of all, you've got to forgive. Colossians 3.13 says it this way. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So you've got to forgive constantly. It's a regular thing. Some of you still have to forgive for things that happened weeks or months ago. Forgive. The other part is it's not enough to forgive in marriage. You have to forget. And that's tough. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, love keeps no record of wrongs. That means that we put those things behind us. 
that we do our very best to not constantly bring up old mistakes, old hurts when we fight. But we wipe the slate clean and we move forward and we forgive and we forget. See, having a marriage that lasts a lifetime is all about becoming one flesh. We do that by becoming one emotionally, one spiritually, and one sexually. This doesn't happen. We have to work at it. It's a process. But here's the thing. Some of that work can actually be fun. And if we do that, we will have the kind of marriage that we all long for, that brings joy to us and brings glory to God that we serve. I want to give married couples two challenges for the next 30 days. So here they are. The first is pray together every single day at night before you go to bed. 30 days. If you do it for 30 days and you're done, perfectly good. It's going to be weird. I've said that multiple times. I'm going to say it one more. It's going to feel weird at first. Don't start it and stop because it's weird for two days because it's going to be. I'm telling you that in advance. If you miss a day, don't let that be the end. Just pick up the next day. Don't let that derail you because you forgot one night because you probably will forget uh, a night. But I want to really challenge you to pray together. It doesn't have to be long, just but for 30 days. Pray together every night before you go to bed. Here's the other challenge for the next 30 days, and this one's going to be more fun. Focus on your sexual relationship. You have frequency, yes. I've increased the frequency, but really what I'm talking about is emphasize it. Put some time into the planning. Maybe go to a hotel one time during that 30-day period. Maybe plan to have the kids somewhere else. Maybe pull out the, the lingerie that hadn't seen the light of day in years. Write some notes to one another saying how excited you are to spend some time together and really emphasize that. And if you will fulfill those two challenges, I'm going to bet you that 30 days from now you'll look back and you'll want to keep doing those things because you'll find yourself becoming one flesh. You know, I grew up in rural northeast Texas. It was in the country. And one of my very favorite places to play was this creek behind our house. And, and I love to go down there because you could play in the water. We could build forts. We would have rock fights where we'd throw big rocks at one another, which isn't nearly as smart as it sounds. But one of the things that I discovered down there that was really cool was these two trees that had grown together over time. They, they started out as two separate trees, separate and disconnected. But over time, they slowly grew closer and closer together until they eventually became one tree. And I think that's a beautiful picture of what it looks like to become one flesh. Two individuals that over time become so united in purpose, so united in thought that they physically become one flesh. Becoming one flesh, that's the roadmap for you. That's the roadmap for your marriage. And the reality is this. If you can never find your way to becoming truly one flesh, living together for the rest of your lives, it's going to feel like an eternity. But if you can find the way to become one flesh, one lifetime won't be nearly long enough. Let's pray.